Welcome everyone. This is episode 20 of the Shoegazing podcast with me, Jesper Ingevaldsson of Shoegazing.com, one of the leading blogs in the world on quality shoes. In this episode, you'll get to meet the very charismatic bespoke shoemaker Patrick Frey from Germany. He made a name of himself more widely when he won the World Championships in Shoemaking in 2018 and is seen by many as one of the greatest shoemakers around today. He works out of his workshop in Freiburg in southwest of Germany together with his shoemaking partner Kasua Kimura. For those of you who have seen shoes made by the Patrick Free workshop, you'll know they have a distinct personal character, an originality and identity one can't find anywhere else. How one achieves this is one of the main topics of our conversation. But we also talk about his rather special way into shoemaking, sort of through juggling on the streets of South America, about his interesting approach on last making, about the balance between tradition and playfulness, and about his obsession with small details and much more. So enjoy the listen. All right, Patrick Frey. Hello. Welcome to the Shoegazing Podcast. Nice to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. We're happy to visit you. Uh, finally get the chance to go and meet the interviewees in person again. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> yeah. To and, be uh, here. I've spent a week here in, in your workshop uh, and it's been yeah really great, I have to say. Very inspiring place for a shoe nerd like me. Yeah, it's nice to talk to experts yes, <laughs> like <yes>. you, <laughs> to share knowledge and uh, also to learn new things. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, my brain is like filled up with new show, shoe knowledge after a week like this, and we've also visited a bunch of really great places. Yeah, but yeah. That's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, I thought, I mean, for a start, uh, even if you've been a uh, bespoke shoemaker for quite a while, uh, you got known for the masses for real, so to speak, after winning the World Championships in shoemaking in 2018. Uh, with an incredibly well-made shoe, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, what did that title mean for you? I mean... Um before I went to the world championships to London, I really worked kind of in a bubble. Mm. Like I'm here in Black Forest and uh, have no big top notch shoemakers around. I learned with a shoemaker who made uh, well made shoes, but not in that level. And so I, I traveled a lot and learned a lot from other good shoemakers. And I knew that I already had a good level, but it's like always if you are in that bubble and alone working on your own, um, that sometimes you think, wow, I'm really a nice, good shoemaker. I, my shoes are extraordinary. And then the other day you think, uh, well, that's not best uh, quality or, right. or I have to improve. And, and that was the same when I entered the contest. Um, I made the shoe and worked many hours, I think 160 hours yeah. only on that shoe. That's that, quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes I thought, wow, will be the best shoe of all. And then the other day I thought, hey, no chance. I can't make it. But uh, then finally I won. And that meant a lot to me, really. Yeah. Like... Um, yeah, receiving all that recognition and attention. Yeah, it, it made me grow a bit and uh, get more self-esteem and know that, um, yeah, what I always wanted to achieve is um, to do it like old masters. And these competitions were um, 100 years ago were common, where yeah. shoemakers on that level competed and just to know yeah I can do that mm. <laughs> I'm able to do a really well made shoe and also to um, match that criteria to make a competition shoe which is a bit different to a customer shoe yeah 
more on the art side, working even finer on maybe less um, focus on functionality, more on the art or the beauty. Yeah. Yeah, that and winning that and also um, seeing the colleagues to be happy that I won because they liked the shoe so yeah, much. Exactly. That really felt uh, yeah. enormous, great. Yeah. yeah, that's what I really like with the contest is that because uh, a lot of you also are in London uh, when we do the sort of uh, prize award mm -hmm. ceremony after jury uh, meetings. And I mean... <clears throat> Is that yeah? What's matter? What matters is the shoes, and that's what people look at and are amazed of, and people are really enjoying seeing others' amazing work. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And did you get new like new customers and stuff like that? Yeah, for you? sure. I mean, I I used to work alone. Now we are three shoemakers here yeah. in the workshop. But um, before I entered the contest, I already had like 10 months waiting time and enough customers but more like from um, European countries and um, then afterwards I had a huge amount of um, interested people yeah. but like it were so many I decided I won't do trunk shows at that state or only visit um some customers that are willing to fly me in um, but not to do regular trunk shows or on a regular basis in in the USA or Asia like I couldn't handle that I would have had so many commissions and uh, so I decided to ask them to come here to Black Forest and it's not that uh, difficult to access but it's like one hour and 20 from uh, Zurich airport um, so um, people really had to come here and to take the um, yeah the time and money and expense mm. to come here um, and many did actually yeah. from Uh, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, Japan, Singapore. Yeah. And, um, but um, at the same time, um, I, I like over the years, um, my prices w went nearer to what a shoemaker should really charge on hourly wage. And like, I think when I started here 10 years ago, I charged for a bespoke shoe, maybe 1,500 euros. Yeah. And now the starting price is at 3,500. So um, the um, customers from Freiburg or the region here got less and international customers, um, yeah, the amount grew. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you have a rather interesting background uh, as a sort of globetrotter juggler. Uh, could you briefly uh, tell us this story? Well, um, before I um, entered shoemaking, I was more, I, I um, worked in different areas, but also finished high school with an um, excellent uh, Decree, mm. which opened all doors for me. Um, but I have always been, since I'm 13, I think, a juggler. Means um, circus stuff. And that pretty uh, soon turned into comedy and juggling and then street performance. And I never did that as my main um, job, but always... Um, did it like I, I really liked it and also on stage and when I traveled I always earned money with that with juggling or street shows mm. and um, that's also a bit connected how I came to shoemaking like um, I always loved um, suitcases yeah the old um, yeah like really nice leather suitcases yeah. Yeah. and I had already When I was 18, I think a collection of maybe 10 or 15 suitcases where I had my circus stuff in. And um, 
I um, traveled in South America for one and a half years and I met there an old man making these very unpractical, heavy and uh, oversized leather suitcases. And when I went to South America, I thought I'd come back to Europe after that time and then study something I didn't know what but to become yeah what my parents or at least my father expected me to to have a uh, a good job a regular, <laughs> a regular office regular, job yeah, yeah. regular whatever something yeah. with economics or doctor or yeah. lawyer or, and um, but there with that old man I I just wanted to try to make a suitcase and I stayed a few months with him and I recognized that I really like to do something with my hands and also to be a creator like have an idea and to be able to to have a vision and create something real you have just an idea a dream and finally um, after good planning and working with the material you have a 3D real object you made yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's still amazing when I for example finish a shoe um, late at night and I'm already a bit too tired and very um, dizzy and it feels a bit like a dream and when I come back the next day to the workshop and I see these shoes um, I think hey did I really make them Is that me? Am, am I able to mm. achieve that? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, so where did you learn shoemaking then? Uh, when I came back from South America, I decided that I want to learn a craft. And um, first I thought about saddlery, making suitcases, bags, and um, maybe um, stuff for artists. Yeah. <laughs> and But then I had a friend who was shoemaker. And um, I once bought leather from a shoemaker. And in both occasions, I saw shoes in different states. Mm. And I never had thought about the making of a shoe. I just, it's like uh, meat on the plate. Mm. It has just been there. Yeah. I have never thought how it, it developed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah, well, then I, I read the wash book mm. he my friend who was showmaker gave it to me and and that was the first time that i thought about wow it's so complicated and being able to make a suitcase which is maybe like 50 steps in the making or a bit more um a shoe is such a complicated thing and I immediately knew that's the like for me the king's discipline to, um, to be able to craft something complicated and first to work with wood make the last then uh, pattern making upper making bottom yeah. making and um, yeah I've, I really felt like magnetic um, pulled to that craft mm. and wanted to learn it yeah and At first, I thought, um, like I spoke to a shoemaker, a repair shoemaker, and he said, if you really want to learn that, you have to find somebody who is really doing it on a daily basis and um, really doing bespoke shoes well. Uh, because if you end up with somebody who knows how to do, but it's not the daily business, uh, it will be hard to learn. Yeah, And so I searched and it was... Yeah, hard to find somebody, but finally I found a master yeah. here in Freiburg. In Freiburg, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who um, came from the theater originally, a theater shoemaker, and he didn't make shoes on the highest level, but the great thing was he did last uppers and bottom in house. And even if most shoes he sold were cemented, he. Um, knew how a welting shoe is done and asked customers during my education um, if they would pay a bit more for a welted shoe and finally I made uh, many welted shoes during my education and learned the basic stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And when did you start your, your own brand? Well, I already had a 
cellar full of tools and machinery during the education yeah. and started um, in the evenings and on weekends to make my own projects. But then after um, the education, I... I visited again that friend I knew, uh, the shoemaking friend who moved back to Munich, where he came from. And um, there was the oldest European shoemaker since, I think, 1540 something, mm. yeah. like nearly 500 years. Mm. And they were like everything like royal shoemaker and uh, of the Bavarian crown <laughs> yeah. and I don't know what and uh, making riding boots for the Nazis and they had a long history and but at that time it was only one old man I think 75 in a um, small workshop but the cellar was bigger than the workshop And there were thousands of lasts and riding boot lasts. And he worked with him and I visited them. And after my education, I thought, um, I'm special. Like if you do something that extraordinary, like shoemaker, everybody says, wow. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. yeah that's so cool. And craft your own shoes. And um, I thought that I know already everything with a good self-esteem in that at that age um, but then there I saw sample shoes maybe around 1900 or 1910 made and they were so perfect mm -hmm. and so balanced and uh, the uppers were yeah I had never seen something like that and I couldn't imagine no electricity no machinery just a sewing machine uh, with foot um, belt and um, yeah and I wanted to achieve that I think that was the initial of um why I'm now who I am or I make shoes like I do mm. that I really wanted to learn the traditional way and not just the compromises I learned then like many shoemakers nowadays are just forced to um, to make shoes that yeah uh, are crafted quite fast and with uh, middle with the material that's not that good and Yeah, and I didn't want that. I wanted to learn how the real deal is done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and then I traveled a lot yeah. to learn that. Yeah. I mean, I saw these and I didn't know how to achieve it. So I traveled a lot to the royal shoemakers um, in London and Vienna and others and uh, learned a lot from old books. I have a um, big collection of antique shoemaking books and um, always experimented in my own workshop traveled a bit experimented again learned new techniques mm. from the books experimented again I forgot one thing to yeah. say yeah. I um, there was one person that inspired me very much when I started shoemaking it's Anthony Delos mm -hmm. when he had his still his own brand um, I think just when he um, put up his web page I found him and followed the new shoes and and um, I really felt um, very good about seeing what he did and how he did it and I think without Anthony Delos I wouldn't have moved that fast because I was just like I want to achieve that yeah. as well yeah so I don't think I have much uh, of Anthony's shoes in my shoes, but just the, the way he did it, the traditional way, but with an own style, yeah, really uh, attracted me. Yeah, cool. And then he and went then, as an employee at the <laughs> big fashion house brand. <laughs> yeah, that was really hard for me. But now I visited him, I think, two years ago. And for the first time, yeah. 
And it was really cool because he's such a nice guy and he still um, cares a lot about shoes and his stuff. And I think he has his own style anyway, even yeah. if it's in yeah, absolutely. brand you, now. When you see a Baluti shoe uh, made by him as sort of with your shoes, you can see that it's a It's an Anthony shoe. Delos yeah. shoe, exactly. And what was very nice as well is that he very much likes my shoes. Mm. So... It's uh, a dream come true, you know, <laughs> somebody like a very uh, high icon and you one day meet him and uh, at first he's very down to earth, a very nice guy. And second, that he respects me as well. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And you started Patrick Frey Must Shoe Hair which year? Yeah, I think 2000. Eight or 2009. Ah, okay. Yeah. It was pretty far. Pretty far. But I have to say that the first two years were still um, self-education. Yeah. I did shoes on a low f price um, for people I knew. But, uh, and that I'm very thankful to my grandfather who um, sold an acre at that time and gave me the money of mm. that acre and said, um, here you, you can establish your, uh, yeah, your workshop. And with that money I had like, yeah, around one and a half or two years time I had that big pressure to earn with the shoes but could still learn yeah. and that was very important to be able um, really to learn the old techniques to travel to talk to other shoemakers because if I would have been hired by somebody and always only being um, like bottom work or upper making um I wouldn't have been able to learn all that stuff mm. I know now. Yeah, I mean, because you do all, all the steps in bespoke shoemaking. Exactly, that's very rare, mm. um, especially in England or France. Uh, when <clears throat> I meet makers there, they're always impressed that I do the um, customer work, <laughs> uh, decide what fits to um, uh, which style is the real thing for the customer and make all the talk and then make the last, make the uppers, uh, make the bottom work and make the, another own profession, um, make the trees. Mm, yeah. yeah. And we are now here in your workshop in Freiburg where you work together with your sort of partner, uh, Japanese uh, Kazuyaki Mura. And uh, you also have uh, the French maker Pierre Baptiste uh, L'Hospital, who is a compagnon de Devois, uh, trainee or what you would call it from, from France. Um, so um, how does it work here in the company now? Um, Pierre Baptiste L'Hospital is quite new here. Yeah. So he's still um, in the process of learning the house style. He makes only fitting shoes at the moment and learns um, what defines our shoes or my shoes here. So um, he's not that involved in the whole process till now. But with Kazuya Kimura, who's here now for more than two years, um, it is really a special thing and a special connection because we established soon something like uh, a very eye-to-eye -eye basis that we talk at least on the same level um, on many steps of the process. Like he's a very skilled and well-educated um, Shoemaker, um, he knows as well all the steps and is as perfectionist that I am and that's the first time I experienced that because I tried before working together with others or employing them and it was always hard because what I need are the last persons <laughs> that somebody really is as um, on fire as me and uh, keen on achieving something extraordinary and special and next to perfect and he has that and um, 
And so we also in the working process, I do most of the last making work, especially for my customers, but on um, sample shoes, he's also yeah doing some last making. And um, all the other things from, I do most of the design, but as well, we talk about it and I ask him for advices or, um, yeah, or input. And then the pattern making, the bottom making, the finishing, um, most of that we are doing together. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Which is quite special. That's very special. And that, I mean, there are times he does more mm. of, for example, um, upper making and um, bottom making. But I, I feel that um, I lose control. <laughs> so I, I also have to... To do some things to be involved in the process that in the end it really feels like my shoes hmm. that if i only would be the manager of that company i mean my shoes live of the spirit or soul and all the details in the shoes and if that gets lost on the way the identity gets lost yeah. a bit and how would you describe uh, the style of the Patrick Frey brand and it's really hard to describe because it's just uh, things that I did or invented or happened on the way that uh, suit me or go with my aesthetics um, but I would say um, I or we have a have special lasts Often, I, I prefer um, for most shoes, let's say, ex except evening shoes that are only for um, seldom wear. Um, I prefer a really good fit to um, very sharp, um, narrow shoes, for example. And so I always wanted my lasts to be wide enough. And for that, I developed from traditional methods and my own way, a last that is a bit asymmetrical, not only from the bottom shape, but on also the toe shape. And, um, not pointing inwards like um, asymmetrical last but the toe is pointing a bit outwards also toe caps are pointing outwards and yeah several things with the lasts but then also the uppers and the making is um, yeah house style it's hard to describe <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah, I mean I, I must accept myself I have a very hard time to this, this sort of define the style of your shoes. Yet, I mean, I can almost always immediately identify that a shoe I see is from Patrick Frey, even if it's a casual style shoe or a dress shoe, in, because you do a lot of different things. Um, so you sort of manage to craft out an originality, I feel, and that's what I hear from others as well. So, so what is the secret to succeed with this? <laughs> I mean, I hear that quite often yeah. that uh, you immediately see that it's one of our shoes. And I think maybe it's, um, yeah, I mean, the identity that's in the shoe, um, but it's, it's also that I like to work very um, detailed and clean, but... I don't like if the shoe looks too much like an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So it can be too clean as well. So I I prefer for um, finishing and also some steps, for example, stitching, that you still see the thread. Um, even if it's only a little bit and it's um, underneath layers of color or wax, you still see the thread. And the same is that you always see the leather structure on the upper leather, on the bottoms. And, um, and another thing what I really like are lines that um, sharp lines means I work already in last making and also the uppers 
um, the modeling always with, with clear lines yeah. even if they are then rounded um, I want the eye to be able to um, hold on these lines and that makes the, the last often I see um, I compare it sometimes to cars or boats that you really have that sharpness mm. and on the other hand a sharpness that's not too conservative that it's sharp but cool <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so is that where you sort of find your inspiration cars and boats and as well mm -hmm. but also in nature mm -hmm. i often see things uh, outside hiking or uh, looking upwards <laughs> as well um and um i'm I have always been nerdy about things when I start some, something. I often do it uh, really deep, dive deep. And uh, for example, I claim to make best coffee in town and restore old lever machines. And um, I'm also or have been very deep into pocket watches. Mm -hmm. And that I had that contact to craftsmanship before I entered shoemaking. And I really love antique pocket watches. And what I love about them, I mean, they are constructed to measure time. But you can do that in a very functional way. And the technique, you could do always the same. But the watchmakers, they were so creative making these movements of watches also the inside of yeah. the watch or the back of the dial um, in so um, aesthetic and beautiful ways and that's what uh, where I get a lot of inspiration from that to connect functionality with beauty and with Yeah, I don't know if you can call it art, but yeah, to many of these watches, to watch them just made me happy mm. how they solved these functional problems. And that's what I try with yeah. shoes as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. And uh, what about other shoemakers and old shoes and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. I mm. mean, I'm, I love... Uh, many of the old shoes well, <clears throat> and the tradition and if you see um, a traditional a classic uh, toe cap Oxford um, and then you try out something else you <laughs> change the pattern in this way and that way and finally you realize you just come back to a really classic original because They used to make it so long, and um, yeah, often the classics are. It's there's a good reason why they are how they are, mm. and um, but nevertheless, also in the past they did very creative things. And uh, Fulbrook or Oxford, they are not like uh, God made them. Mm. They are not here forever. They are here for maybe 150 years. Yeah. So um, that they are here, um, they had to be um, creative and brave shoemakers to do something new, invent something. And that's what I like, that to connect traditional things with new things. Hmm. Yeah, because I mean, many of your shoes are very playful and yet highly wearable. Uh, is that sort of the ambition? Well, um, I get bored uh, quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually don't do the exactly same shoe twice. Yeah. Also, if it's a black Oxford, it's always different for a customer. Like the customer is different. The feet are different. So uh, the need is different. The last making is different. But then, for example, with the cap toe, It's a good example. Um, long caps are more extrovert. Short caps are more feminine. And uh, straight last uh, with corners is more um, st 
straight and extrovert mm. and a round one is more subtle and maybe not um, too much look here I, here I am mm. means um, I try to find the personality of the customer in the shoe means the last shape the design of the Oxford is different always and then I try to do um, yeah new details and that always I try to stay quite close to the tra traditional stuff because it's a thin line to kitsch yeah and you can invent new things and um, do something special but if it's too special it will destroy the rest of the concept so yeah I, I mean I don't find them too playful and it's always in the eye of um, the yeah of the different groups of people who watch that for very conservative people they would um, some of my shoes they would say it's absolute no go it's so not traditional even the championship mm, winner yeah. um, was a very traditional shoe but had some new uh, invented stuff in it and the traditionalists would have maybe said no that's not how it's meant to be and others find all my shoes even the very playful extremely conservative like that's uh, yeah um, a leather shoe yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah and I mean we talked shoes quite a lot through the years uh, we spent a week together in uh, Japan once and uh, uh, now here a week as well and um, uh, what I enjoy with you is that you are extremely nerdy with the details uh, and the same with your colleagues here in the workshop but, but you, you seem to like you can spend a lot of time on things that maybe very few will notice um, why is the details so important to you? Um, I don't know <laughs> yeah but um, I don't do that for other people I do that for me I just have to I'm obsessed with that I I think um, in general details many details make the whole thing mm. and if all the details are good the whole thing is good and then in the end you don't notice the details the most of you notice the overall picture and most people will never go to a shoe and look very close and then say wow this seam looks extremely nice and just the shoe blogger nerds they uh, then say the seam is maybe a bit off or uh, whatever but most people just say wow that's a beauty it's why is that shoe so beautiful and that's not because of that seam it's because of all the details that are together and sometimes some details are more important than others and I just think uh, it's the way it has to be done to focus on these details and I'm not the only one it's many of these details I do nowadays other shoemakers skipped but if you read in the old books many of these things they used to do and it was like that's the way you do it and I also pay respect yeah to the tradition and to old shoemakers and because I'm very thankful what they established over the centuries that they um, yeah invented new things and then focused on these details and spent for small things many hours and I just think it's yeah it's it shall be <laughs> yeah it shall be <laughs> and with the amount of bespoke shoemakers uh, around today all who can showcase this stuff uh, easily globally uh, in social media and online and so on I mean how it is, how important is it to have your own style and be original <sighs> well um, 
it's a difficult question because to have an own own style um, if you start shoemaking which is so difficult to learn I mean uh, I have heard f from many makers and I would say that also that you need between six and eight or nine years to fully learn the whole process not only one of the parts and that means it's a very long time to learn that and if, if you think from the beginning you start that with your own style <laughs> that just can't work I mean you have to learn from others so you learn their style yeah. and, and um, means if you start too early to develop a very personal style the it's very dangerous that you end up with something that's not good or not a wholesome thing that that you don't see your own style because only if like even if very little people wear proper shoes now we are used to look at shoes and uh, l yeah look at aesthetic things and lines and and if you are only in one of the little things off um, it will look strange to the eye and then what's your personal thing is not visible and and also to like nearly everybody who makes something that special like uh, art craft thing also wants to be seen I think a bit yeah. and so it's dangerous to try to be seen with extrovert or um, heavy stuff and um, finally to um, yeah to destroy the idea that is behind so I think it's really good to learn at first traditional shoemaking and to deal with the different heel shapes and um, possibilities to weld the shoe and stitching methods and finishing methods and uh, different upper making styles and then I think your own thing will come out mm. alone because you just then feel attracted to a uh, certain style and maybe try new things out and then it will come out. And But if you are too frightened to do own things, it's you're lost as well because the traditional shoe, most people don't notice a difference. If I make a 10,000 euro, uh, 400 hours um, high-end best shoe I ever made and I put a very cheap leather shoe next to it, they will maybe say this one looks a bit better, but actually they look more or less the same. Mm. If one is more shine than the other, then Exactly. That will make the most difference to many people. <laughs> exactly. So if you stick to only the traditional stuff and you try to compete in that competitive world, you will be lost as well. So it's anyway a hard way. Yeah. <laughs> you have to learn the tradition and then surely develop your own style hmm. Yeah, to be seen. Yeah. And I mean, do you have any more? Because that's a good advice, I think, to, you know start with learning from others and then go forward with your own style. Do you have any more good ideas for someone who are sort of entering the shoe world and uh, uh, looking at developing their own brand uh, so that they can be able to carve out their own niche in the market? Um, trainers? <laughs> <laughs> no, um Yeah, that's really hard to say. I mean, especially if somebody... I, I get a lot of um, applications that yeah. people want to work here or um, make an apprenticeship or um, ask me for advices. And I usually try at first to destroy their innocent dream to be a shoemaker because really most people think it's 
just beautiful, beautiful materials, beautiful tools, beautiful product. But it's, it's such a hard way to learn it and then to survive with it. And um, like maybe when you're 18 or 20 or 22, It's not a problem. You want that and you will make sacrifice, but then your life maybe changes. You meet somebody, you get uh, children, you want, uh, I don't know, your big fat Mercedes. <laughs> no. I mean, you want something to have something to have security. And so uh, for sure, Shoemaker is not very good to have that mm. because even if you're making a very expensive luxury product the amount of hours in it and all the experience you have to gain you will never get rich with that or even have enough security so um, and it's also very frustrating at the same time it's if you make a bag Or a suitcase, it just have, has to be beautiful and um, the purpose is uh, carrying it around and put things in. But to walk in something and that this feels comfortable and every customer, every mind, every history, all the feet are different. Um, so it's really hard to achieve a good fitting shoe and it has to last for 10, 15, 20 years. So the, the bar is so high. And so I always tell them, it's not that you come in the workshop and light your candle in the morning and you feel just oh, everything's so beautiful and oh, I, I get so much attention because I'm a shoemaker. And so I destroy the dream and if they still want it I give them some advices <laughs> well, how they could do it but I also give them the advice that there are other beautiful crafts that are easier to learn like I I think carpenter or settler is both very nice and you can start off with easy projects you can as settler you make a belt or a wallet as carpenter um, you make an um, simple stool or just anything out of wood and to make a shoe on your own if you don't know last making don't know pattern upper making don't know bottom making it's yeah, very hard so but my advice would be um, if like there are two good ways to learn shoemaking one is make a classic traditional education with a yeah. master because but it like I was told it has to be somebody who makes shoes on a regular basis that you really learn shoemaking and you have to make many shoes many shoes yeah. that's it that's the, the big advantage most shoemakers after their apprenticeship they don't know how to make a shoe but they know how bottom making works. Like they did many bottoms, many lasting and bottoms. And then you are a machine. I mm. mean, that's what you did for years. Um, making the stiffeners, uh, the counters, lasting, welting, um, heel building. So that's at least one part you really can do and hopefully quite fast. And The other way is to um, fundraising, <laughs> ask family, friends, yeah. whoever, if um, or maybe you have money, they, uh, your family um, wanted to give you for the driver's license and you now spend it on shoemaking. Um, and then you are able to learn on your own and find other makers who share knowledge but they are more willing to share knowledge if you already can show something so that's also easier if you already worked in shoemaking so i think best way is maybe a combination yeah find somebody who gives you a traditional apprenticeship and then go on your own and pick things you want mm -hmm. to learn because the danger if you do a traditional apprenticeship that you stick with your master or go to the next place and stick there and stick with bottom making and uh, and have a um, 
Bad back with 40. Yeah, <laughs> sitting on those small little uh, <laughs> stools. Um, yes, yeah. and or work as an out worker for other makers. And um, yeah, it's not ideal, let's say, if you want to have your own shoe mm. brand. If you want mm. to be a bottom maker, it's cool. Yeah. And then, I mean, uh, as you mentioned before, wait with starting to define your own style and all those parts yeah or just move slowly yeah, yeah. not yeah. not uh, if you try to make something very different it will um, harm your recognition <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patrick Frey, uh, thank you very much for being part of the Shoegazing podcast. Yeah, thank you very much for being here and um, yeah, for asking all that stuff. Yes, <laughs> I'm very happy to. <laughs> all right, yeah, cheers. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for listening in on this episode. If you enjoy the podcast, please give it a good rating or comment in your podcast player. The Shoegazing Podcast will be back with a new episode in a little while, so hear you again soon. Mm-hmm.